This is for educational purposes. There's nothing being solicited. Uh, I am a investment advisory representative with Financial Network Investment Corporation, and securities and investment advisory services are offered through Financial Network Investment Corporation. So one of the strategies that we are now using, and we're using it more and more and more, is a strategy called risk parity. But risk parity is at every moment in time seeking to put you on this, this risk return curve at an optimum location. The optimum place to exist, if you had to trade risk for return, is somewhere over here, okay? Not out here, and certainly not back here, because <clears throat> I can, you know, I, it's, it's in this range. So risk parity, what it does is this is where it takes different asset classes. In this case, we're going to use stocks represented by the S&P 500, bonds represented by the Barclays 30-year index, and we'll use commodities represented by one of the major commodity indexes and say, listen, over the long run, <clears throat> if you account for how much risk you have to take, how much volatility you have to take in each of these three pieces and compare that to the amount of return that you get, they're about all at the same trade-off. Okay, they, they exist just like every other asset on this risk return curve. The, the challenge is, is that you want to have more exposures to one thing versus another as prices change. And we're not a market timing firm, so we're not in or out, you know, buy big, sell big, but we do want to recognize discounts and excesses in prices. So the way that, it, that this risk parity works is, is it starts off with this target of let's do a third, a third, a third. And, and, and that's sort of our framework, but then they're looking at volatility. And, and so how, how they might process this in kind of a big picture is, is let's say we're trying to get parity between stocks and bonds. If, if we have 50-50 uh, stocks and bonds, and the stock market goes up like a rocket, your statement's going to go up, even if bonds drag, okay? If you have 50-50 stock and bonds, and the stock market crashes, your portfolio is going to go down significantly. Even though bonds might go up a little, bonds only have a little bit of influence compared to the, the weighting of stocks. So I'm trying to illustrate this, this lever because stocks have more volatility as an asset class. So they move up, they have more oomph in what's happening than, say, what bonds do. So when you think about, I want to have this much risk and this much return, you could pick a portfolio at a static moment in time and get on this curve. But as soon as you have a price dislocation and stocks go up a bunch or go down a bunch, you're not on the curve anymore. So what risk parity does is it looks at price movements on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis and says if volatility is expanding rapidly, either up or down, it moves the fulcrum to adapt for that, for that risk. So if you think about this in a, in a, in a technical sense, so these are the inputs. If you've got two asset classes, if one increases volatilities and the covariance is going up, then you take money off the table. Think of it like if we had oil as a part of our portfolio and it started selling off rapidly. Maybe somehow they, they found a, you know, a whole mother load of oil and it's just ready to go, pump it out of the ground, and prices were falling rapidly. If you had a risk parity strategy in, as soon as those prices started falling, your exposure would be decreased rapidly. You might lose a little bit as they're coming out, but, but if it continues to fall off the cliff, you're long out of the asset class. If the stock market started having you know, another uh, meltdown and prices start declining, the volatility is spiking up and a risk parity strategy would demand that we come out of the asset class quickly as prices begin to fall rapidly. And on the flip side, things that are having decreasing volatility and decreasing covariance, you actually would be increasing exposures. You know, maybe if we're looking at a commodity strategy and oil is starting to fall, but man, look at corn. It's just been just steady eddy or whatever, you know, other cattle futures or soybeans. <clears throat> you would see more going into the, the asset that has, we're not looking at pricing as much as volatility. If the prices are steady, they're going to have more of it. When prices start getting gyrations, they come out of it. That's how risk parity is structured. And ultimately, what, what the, the end result of that is, is that you get something that kind of looks like this. And what this is, is there's a group called Natixis <clears throat> that's been running a risk parity strategy 
They've been running institutionally for years, but they are now available in retail accounts. Uh, this is a strategy where they're taking uh, global equity, sort of like the EFI. They're taking global bonds, which is going to be bonds from all countries and all uh, credit ratings. They're taking commodities, and then they're taking currencies. And the, you see the day-to-day -day volatility. This isn't returns. This is day-to-day -day spikes in volatility. And they manage the strategy so that they're trying to keep the volatility minimized. And the, the risk parity strategy is the blue line. And so when you constantly move that fulcrum back and forth between two different asset classes, you can actually control volatility. You can't stop it, but you can tighten up the range of it. And when we go back to our very first slide, we talk about market emotions. When things are really going down in a hurry, if you could tighten up the range, it's going to make you feel more comfortable in staying put in what you're trying to do in the long run. So that's a strategy that's called risk parity. This is a little hard to read, and it may even be hard to read in your handout, but this is some examples where risk parity over periods of time have, have produced results. So I'll just read you a couple of these. Um, Long-term risk parity strategy between commodities, high-quality bonds, and U.S. stock market <coughs> has averaged 11.2% uh, from 1976 to the end of 2010. The 60-40 the model, where you have so much in stocks and bonds, it only made 9.6%. So there's an improvement in the return. Standard deviation is actually the same, because they're targeting it to be the same. And then look at these different periods. So Nixon price control, 71 to 2009. Um, tough time for the market. Stocks made 8% for that whole entire period of time. Well, the 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Risk parity made 53%. That's pretty significant. Uh, the market crash in 1987, it was a huge drop, 22% 20, loss in a single day. Well, in that event, risk parity lost 1.8, and the 60-40 portfolio, stocks to bonds, lost 11. Pretty big difference. Um, the surprise red hi rate hikes from the Fed in, in 94, Risk parity lost money, lost 9%, and Barclays Ag lost minus 5. So it actually lost a little bit more as interest rates uh, were being manipulated up by the Fed. And then if you look at like the credit crisis, which we all just lived through from July of 2007 to March of 2009, the risk parity strategies typically lost about a half a percent in that period where the average of a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio lost 27%. That is an amazing set of outcome from statistical data. And it's just about moving those relationships daily. So when we do alternatives, this is how you apply it to what we're doing. In our portfolios, I've already turned the board over. In our portfolios, we allocate a certain part to alternative assets. We are including risk parity strategies inside of the alternative asset sleeve. Because we think the more and more we add to that, the more and more we're, we're, we're going to tighten up the range of volatility in your accounts. So that is a big thing that we think we need to be looking at more and more as we move forward. The S&P 500 index is a widely recognized measure of the U.S. stock market performance. It is an unmanaged index of 500 common stocks chosen for market size, liquidity, and industry group representation, among other factors. The Barclays Capital U.S. Aggregate Bond Index is an unmanaged index that covers the U.S. dollar-denominated investment-grade fixed-rate taxable bond market of the SEC-registered securities. The index includes bonds from the Treasury, government-related, corporate, mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, and collateralized mortgage-backed securities sectors. Barclays Capital U.S. Intermediate Government and Credit Bond Index is an unmanaged index that includes U.S. Treasuries, government-related issues, and investment-grade U.S. corporate securities with remaining maturities of 1 to 10 years. Barclays Capital U.S. Long Government Credit Bond Index is the long component of the Barclays U.S. Government and Credit Bond Index and is widely recognized index which features a blend of U.S. Treasury, government-sponsored, U.S. agency, and supranational mortgage and corporate securities limited to a maturity of more than 10 years. Barclays Capital U.S. Corporate High Yield Bond Index is an unmanaged index that covers U.S. dollar-denominated, non-investment-grade, fixed-rate, taxable corporate bond market securities. Citigroup One Month Treasury Bill Index measures monthly return equivalents of yield averages that are not marked to market. This index consists of the last one month issues. Returns for this index are calculated on a monthly basis only. The Consumer Price Index is an inflationary indicator that measures the change in the cost of a fixed basket of goods and services, including housing, food, electricity, and transportation. The Sharp Ratio is a measure of historical adjusted performance calculated by dividing the fund's excess returns by the standard deviation of those returns. 
The higher the ratio, the better the fund's return per unit of risk. Investors cannot invest indirectly into indexes. The performance of any index is not indicative of the performance of any investment and does not take into account the effects of inflation and or fees and expenses associated with investing.